Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, this week's edition of our Livestock Update webinar. We think we've got a good uh, program plan for you. Um, hopefully you can see that slide and uh, the audio is coming through fine. If somebody wants to drop a note in the chat box just to make sure and give us uh, another minute or so, some people are joining us uh, and we'll get things started. Good deal. To get us um, get us started uh, this afternoon, we're happy to uh, have a couple of our colleagues from VDAX with us. Uh, uh, Matt Spinagle and, and John Beam have joined us and uh, going to visit a little bit about uh, what's happening in the marketplace and, and so forth. Um, Matt, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm in the process of, uh, of sharing your slides and uh, turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Scott. Um, so I was asked to be a part of this. I'm just going to tag team this along with my co colleague, uh, John Beam. And I'm going to cover first a few things that are going on in the national beef scene right now. And then I got a slide or two about some land prices at the end. Uh, I got a few slides to go through, some uh, graphs, but I promise none of them are very complicated if you can follow along on your screen. It just sort of a uh, blunt pictures of really what's going on right now. Puts it a bit in perspective. Um, all right, Scott, you can go to the next slide. So the uh, three current topics I really want to cover with you all on the national scene is what our current state of our slaughter cattle market is. Um, we're going to talk about the livestock futures a little bit, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And then just a uh, slide on two to three year impacts of what this COVID-19 might leave on our beef industry. Altogether, we're unsure of that, but a little bit of an outlook. All right, so this slide here is shows, it comes directly from the National Daily Cattle and Beef Summary uh, that was updated on May the 7th yesterday. Uh, it's the five area week, weekly weighted average steer prices. Um, so this is a live weight price. If you look over on the left, that's uh, 100 weight prices. And you can see that red line there is the 2020 line. Uh, if you follow the months at the bottom, you can clearly see uh, we were in March and April. We, uh, we really plummeted. We had a little bit of a spike there in April that kind of came through impulse buying um, when we started going into isolation. Uh, and that was prior to our packing houses shutting down uh, and slowing up. Just to put it in perspective, what kind of price drop we've suffered over 30, 45 days, uh, it's about $315 per head uh, on a finished cattle going from $1.20 to 97 and a half cents. If you talk about a full load of cattle that we're selling and a feedlot guy is reselling, He's lost over eleven thousand uh, dollars in value on those cattle going off of this chart. Uh, one thing in the, in the sale barns right now, it's not uncommon to see a fifteen dollar per hundred weight spread in the price of finished cattle. Uh, it kind of shows just how weary the market is right now and uncertain of the true value of the cattle. Uh, some other slides will show where we feel like this ought to be different, but a big thing about that slide, many of these guys are killing them when they can get kill spots. That partially explains the decline in prices. There's not a lot of bargaining power with the Packers right now. So this slide, this is the slide that everybody wants to talk about at the moment. Um, get some people boiling hot, uh, can lead to some false hope for some others probably. This slide is already outdated. Yesterday, our box beef cutout uh, closed at 458. So add another 100 to it. Um, 
This slide is a very direct cause of supply and demand from the processors to the retailers. I think that's important for a lot to understand. Because our packing houses have been necked down, many have closed, uh, they're running on shorter shifts, they're running at slower chain speeds, they're putting less cattle out the door, retailers are still trying to sell it. That is a, a, the direct explanation of this chart. Um, so definitely don't be, I'll hit a few more things on that one, definitely don't think that this is from the feedlot uh, to the retail. This is directly from processing to retail. This is not exactly uh, a good thing. The cause and effect of this chart is not gonna be in favor of the cow-calf guys and the feedlot guys. Um, it's all because of low kill volumes and those low kill volumes are gonna relate to two negative things. Uh, we'll talk about the other side is we're backlogging those cattle that we're not killing right now. And the other question is, when do we price ourselves out of the market? Altogether, this price point hasn't hit the retail markets yet. And honestly, I think as producers, we all kind of hope that this levels out before it ever does hit uh, the retailers and let them swallow some of it. So we don't lose, lose uh, shelf space. All right, next slide. So this next one, uh, it's a decline in beef production. Um, so if you look over, this is actually thousands of head on the left. Uh, and that purple line is the 2020 compared to the green line being our five year average and the red line being last year's. If you do the numbers on this, we're killing about 150 to really 200,000 head less per week than we were prior to COVID-19. When we're typically killing about 600 to 650,000 head a week, you know, leaving 200,000 in the feedlots is a big, big deal. It won't take long of this before we could build up a million head of fats, backlogs still waiting to be killed. Not only does that make our feeding side inefficient, but it also makes our carcass weights go up. Right now, we're not seeing a, much of a growth in carcass weights because we're still killing some formula cattle, the ones that are getting killed, cattle that were contracted to kill on a certain date. When the cattle that are not contracted finally come to town, I think we're gonna see a big spike in carcass weights, which is gonna ultimately lead to a lot of meat that can, has to be moved. Um, Trump's orders, when he put the packing plants under the Defense Production Act, this is one thing he helped keep from going clear to the bottom um, by making sure some of those packing houses stayed open that could. This is the slide for you all that remember this one because it will have a big effect in future beef prices. It could take us a year or more to clean up the animals that aren't getting killed right now. When they do finally open up and we start operating at capacity, uh, it, it could take a whole year to clean those cattle back up. And ultimately, we're going to face the risk of oversupplying our retail market at that point. All right. So we've kind of discussed a lot of this. It's just a picture uh, description of the cattle market on a national level right now. There on the left, you got your blue box of fed cattle that are available. That small size of the beef processing capacity that is ultimately caused by the plant shutdowns. Uh, we've reduced shifts, we've slowed the chain speeds. We've implemented a lot of safety practices and social distancing in those plants with, which have altogether slowed them down. Um, they're not getting as many employees to come to work right now. Um, and all while that blue box continues to grow um, as we're not killing what we need to. We're, we're really out of currency. We're losing all of our currency that we had with the market. We're building up a big backlog of fed cattle. Okay. So uh, just quick on the futures markets. As you look down through uh, that sheet, if you can read them, our futures markets have played um, a different role. We're, we're hitting around a upper 90s to low dollar right now. Uh, and if you click one, Scott, we'll go to the next one. 
So this is the June 2021 uh, since about the first of the year. As you can tell, when COVID-19 hit, we were already in a decline in future prices. This is non-exact representation of what cattle were uh, trading for negotiated live. Uh, they were trading a little bit higher than this graph uh, on the futures, but this is kind of shows what happened to our market when that coronavirus took over on March 12th there is about when uh, government orders started coming out, mandates to stay home, closing restaurants. You can see where our market went. Uh, the trust in that market just went down and, and stayed low. Here recently, the last two days, we've been trading really, um, really it's been limited up the last two days, which I think you can result to some of that high uh, box beef prices that speculators are looking into and seeing, as well as we're starting to get the economy up and going. Many states are starting to open up restaurants, let people get out again. <clears throat> Next. So this is just kind of my thoughts, the two to three year impact that I think we could see, and there's a lot more than what's in this slide, but overall, I think it's safe to say we can expect a very slow recovery time. Um, we're gonna have to clean up that fed cattle surplus, and at, that's all gonna come at the risk of oversupplying the retailers. Um, and then uh, consumer budgets are gonna change, and buying habits are gonna change when all this, uh, cleans up. A lot of people have been out of work and that's going to affect their protein choices when they go to the stores. And I think we're going to live with a fear of uh, the virus relapse. relapse will always loom over us for another year or so. The next one is, is strictly from my standpoint, but I think one thing that could help us clean up that oversupply is possibly see a government support program come out in the food, in the form of a food subsidy program. <clears throat> the government has implemented these in the past. Most recently they did it a few years ago with the lamb industry. Um, and that really just helps clean up that supply and make our market current again. Um, the other thing that I think we'll see from this with continued down prices from our feeder calf sales right now, we're gonna continue to see heifers go to feed. Uh, despite those low prices, it just doesn't pay people to keep them back. That's all with the beef, so we'll cover a few slides with lamb and goats real quick. It's hard to talk about East Coast lamb markets without knowing what New Holland is doing, uh, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we haven't got any price reports out of there since mid-March. We can tell the prices. It appears as if volume is staying pretty steady, but we're not getting any feedback on how those animals are selling. Here in Virginia, we can kind of surprising to many, I think, to me for sure, the lamb and the kid goat prices have really remained pretty strong. Um, those sale barns that are operating and get many lambs and goats, there's high quality new crop lambs, under 85 pounds, which is the majority of the supply right now, they're bringing $1.80 to over $2. When you put the $2 in front, that definitely gets a lot of people in the lamb market excited about it. Um, but I, I would definitely want to note there and point out those are lighter weight new crop lambs. Uh, when we, we really haven't had any tests of those 130 plus pound lambs. And it's important to understand the difference of where those lambs head. Uh, these 85 pounds and under lambs are going more into a non-traditional ethnic market. Those 130 plus pound lambs tend to go more to a restaurant trade. Uh, which is currently dead right now. Um, that market has not been tested really hard. We'll see as these lambs get bigger where it goes to, where we get some of these uh, spring show lambs coming, coming to the sale floor. Goat Kids, uh, Winchester on Monday, they brought $3.50 a pound, uh, which is pretty impressive. Uh, right now, we'll just ride that. We'll see where it goes. I think we are still operating on a kind of a moderate to low volume in the sale barns though. As the summer goes on, um, we'll, we'll see where it leads to. Upcoming ethnic holidays that will be important to pay attention. Right now we're in the month of Ramadan, which is uh, the month of feasting for the Muslims uh, in May 23rd. So the end of this month, we'll have the end of that. Uh, will be a test of the markets. 
And then Eid at Ha, which is a festival of sacrifice, continues to back up each year, and it will be in July this year. Will be the other big test of the markets. We'll see a lot of southern sheep and western sheep come to the east coast for that particular market. All right. Next two slides are just price quotes. Uh, this is a recent from last previous Saturday uh, at Shenandoah Valley. It's one of the bigger lamb and goat markets in the valley. Kind of shows. Um, Lambs pretty much traded from $1.80 to $2. One thing I want everyone to be aware of when they look at these price reports, it's got like 101 to 130 pound heavy lambs from $1.50 to $2. That's a pretty big spread and it can be quite misleading. There's no information there about the volume that was sold um, and that's a, a big spread. That $2 could be a 101 pound lamb, where the $150 could be a 130 pound lamb. Uh, th so there's really not any good test of those weights right now. Next slide. I drew this out of Sioux Falls. They have a pretty big uh, lamb and goat market in South Dakota. Um, some of the, our bigger buyers in the east will from time to time buy out of the Sioux Falls market. I added there on the right hand side, if you can read it, just the dollars per head for what they were selling for. It kind of takes things into account that regardless of heavy prices, those prices are going down uh, at total dollars per head. No animal sold over really $1.70, $170 a head, excuse me. Um, so just showing on the East Coast, our traditional market tends to buy animals on dollars per head when they leave the stockyard. That's how they are resold. And I uh, think it's important to note showing that these lightweight lambs are bearing in big prices per pound, but not necessarily big prices per head. So Scott, that's all I have. Uh, I'll let John take over on the state of Virginia now and answer questions later. Yeah, that'd be fine, Mike. Uh, John, are you, uh... Are you with us? Uh, can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I don't have I don't have a camera on my computer, so I, I want to talk a little bit about what's been going on uh, here at home in Virginia with uh, our feeder cattle. Uh, a couple things uh, to start with: uh, all the all the livestock markets that I know of are open now. Uh, in uh, during April, uh, there was only two markets. That Closed at any time. Uh, Winchester market was closed for two weeks, and the Tri-State market in Abington was closed for two weeks. Uh, those these are much larger markets. Uh, they get a lot more people in them. Uh, they tend to have some people come from outside the area to cross state lines. So those, those management, those yards are both concerned, but they, but they and all of the markets have requested that uh, uh, they not people not come and uh, be spectators and, and uh, during the sale time and they would like uh, to have social distancing inside the market and uh, also and just the rent almost uh, the uh, buyers who were serious buyers. So they've, uh, they've tried to do what they can but still continue to uh, market our cattle that uh, uh, we, we currently need. So we appreciate them doing that. For our prices on our cattle, it's we've had two <laughs> two entirely different uh, uh, um, situations with our grass cattle or any cattle that are eligible to go to grass. They have. Uh, uh, see, I need to get closer to the mic. Are you having trouble hearing me? Try that again, John. That was a little better there. Are, are you having trouble hearing me? That's much better. Okay, all right. Let me make a change here. Uh, but our grass cattle have, uh, uh, they've stayed very steady since earlier in the year. Uh, they probably didn't get as high as we thought they might at one time uh, because of the, uh, the virus. But uh, there's been really good demand for those cattle going to grass. 
and uh, even the heavier cattle, six and seven weights, if they were if they were in decent flesh to go to grass, they've held in there quite well. But uh, of course, any cattle, heavier cattle that uh, uh, would be headed to feedlot, uh, they've been uh, certainly a disappointment. And they've kind of followed what the fat cattle market has done, and they've dropped considerably. I don't have any numbers on percentage wise, but they uh, we were selling um, uh, seven and eight weight cattle back in January for in the dollar thirties and dollar forties, and uh, uh, the eight weights. Uh, Recently, uh, they we're probably looking at something at a dollar, uh, anywhere from a dollar to a dollar fifteen on the on the, on the most uh, on a full good load of full cattle. Um, in the past week, however, uh, this week on the most recent market report uh, put out by our market news uh, office at, with VDAX, uh, they have shown um, that the lighter cattle have dropped off. I think like a instance of Five weight steer, the weighted average, uh, those cattle were six dollars lower than last week. The uh, four weight steers were about four fifty lower than last week. I think we can contribute that for two reasons. Uh, one is uh, uh, probably a lot of the grazers are getting filled up. They like to have their cattle in place pretty much by now. And the other thing is we're starting to get more. Uh, fall born uh, balling calves that are fleshier and those cattle are not as desirable as you well know to go be turned out on grass. So especially this late in the season. So that's probably the difference there. Actually the, the heavier cattle have, they might've seen a little, they've been either steady or maybe showed a little more strength in the market, which uh, followed the, if it was uh, any cattle sold later than in this week because of the Futures market has uh, gone up limit tw two days this week. That's that would have helped. That uh, we've got a uh, Virginia Cattlemen Association has a, a tell auction uh, sale coming up this Monday night uh, on the 11th. Uh, we got we don't have a lot of cattle, but we do have a load of 700 pound uh, fall born calves and a load of nine weight yearlings. So they uh, hopefully that'll kind of give us an idea of what some of these heavier cattle are worth, and because we as we don't have it, we don't see that many going through the weekly sales. So uh, uh, I think, uh, as far as I know, we we'll kind of catch up on what's going on here in Virginia. And uh, uh, biggest thing I think we need right now is some warm weather to make our grass and our hay come along. So uh, uh, we. We're good moisture in southwest Virginia. I don't know about the rest of the state, but uh, we're good moisture. We just need some warm weather and sunshine. I think that's all I got, uh, Scott. So I'll turn it back over to you. Very good. Thanks, John. Um, we'll take a minute or two here. If you've got questions uh, for Matt or for John, if you want to put them in the text box or the droop chat, we'll get those relayed. Uh, appreciate that. While we're doing that, um, just as a follow up to what Matt visited about uh, with the sheep market. I found a couple of good resources there um, at the national level with ASI. They got a podcast and some stuff uh, uh, that they're posting. It's um, I find it useful. Of course, uh, our market here very much follows what's happening nationally, at least from a trend standpoint. So you can kind of keep up to date with what's happening there. And then, of course, uh, uh, the VDAX website, particularly on the cattle side, has got uh, current prices and so forth, um, just to kind of as a resource. John, Matt, I would ask one question. Uh, I guess, uh, it, what advice would you have for our producers and those working with producers on the webinar here this afternoon? If they've got cattle close to going from a marketing standpoint, um, what advice would you give them relative to price exploration and trying to figure out where they're gonna, gonna sell those calves, et cetera? Well, um that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, you, you know, kind of, if they're lighter cattle, I think, to me, well, it might have missed a chance you got grass weight cattle. Uh, but at this point in time, it may be better off, uh, uh, especially if you got calves still on the cows. Uh, but I would, I would, in most cases, I'd recommend, um, 
waiting as long as possible to, to market the cattle. Uh, if you do have fall born calves and want, uh, I would strongly recommend you uh, uh, getting them uh, uh, weaned come June and July and maybe look at some of the DQA sales or uh, those kind of sales to, to put them on because they just, uh, there's just a whole lot more demand for these. Uh, any calves that are weaned and vaccinated and have a short bound uh, background and program, they're just they're just a whole lot worth a whole lot more money, and the, the guys buying them really like them, and they not uh, they don't have to do all the work, and they, these calves get straightened out a lot better on the farm with a lot less health and sickness and death loss. So, uh, you know, for calves, I would be I would strongly recommend. To, be looking to get them into one of those programs um, and uh, I, but I you know everybody's hoping that you know if we wait the longer we can wait to sell our cattle the better off we are but we don't really know but uh, uh, as you well as we all know but uh, I think that would be that would be my advice for anybody asking right now on yearling cattle you know I that are on grass, I think we need to look at making them eight, seven, and eight weights anyway. I don't know. Sometimes it pays to make them nine weights on steers and eight weights on heifers. But uh, but it, but the longer we go, hopefully the better off it'll be as far as uh, um, getting them sold and the man for the feed, for cattle going to feedlot. Thank you, John. Guys, we appreciate that update. Uh, well done. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Curran, and Dr. Curran will share some thoughts about uh, management and marketing options currently and kind of follow up to what we discussed a couple of weeks ago. Dr. Curran. Dr. Griner. Um, all right, yep, to follow up from where we were. Uh, two weeks ago and talk about some of our decision-making points and how we think those might potentially be different uh, in this environment. Uh, this time we're going to kind of focus on fall calves. Uh, what about marketing? Uh, when to wean and how to feed them? So what, are, what about the marketing options? Um, so I took, I took some uh, options here and looked and said days back grounded, uh, 60 or 90 days steers and heifers, uh, and took current prices. Uh, those were the prices from a local uh, buying station for uh, top uh, steers and heifers at 550 and 500 pounds uh, just this past week. And then uh, looked and said, okay, if you backgrounded them for 60 or 90 days, uh, how much would you have to sell those for to, to break even and get the same amount of dollars? And you can see that's the fourth column there. So those steers are worth $1.32 this week. Uh, heifers about $1.15 at 550 and 500 pounds. And then uh, you can see the break even point uh, for selling those calves uh, after you backgrounded them. And then the net last two columns in are, uh, let's say I wanna make $50 a head or $100 a head return uh, on my labor and infrastructure. Uh, so that would be uh, to pay you to, to wean those calves and then your cost for uh, your, your uh, trough, feed troughs and, and, and that sort of thing, uh, you know, return for that. Uh, you know, I, I want to be optimistic. Uh, I hope that we're going to get through summer here pretty good and, and we're going to do that. I got nothing but uh, just some gut feelings and hope that that'd be the case. Uh, but you can see uh, just like the, our, our marketing experts were just talking about there in the state of Virginia, a pretty decent, uh, if the market just stays decent, uh, we background these calves and wean these calves, I think there's some good opportunity for us to get uh, some pretty good additional value uh, if these cattle just retain, uh, retain their current value at all. You know, obviously it's a little bigger calf we're selling uh, after we get out 60 and 90 days of backgrounding them. Uh, but I think there's plenty of opportunity there for us to add some more value. And the key thing here is the cheaper these cattle get, the more important to you guys that are, that are cow-calf operators, 
the more important this extra value is. If we drop the, the net profit from uh, 150 bucks a head on steers uh, down to you know, 75 or 100 dollars a head because the price of those steers went down, then suddenly adding that extra 50 or 100 pound, 100 dollars for backgrounding those calves uh, becomes a whole, a whole lot better deal and adds a significant amount of percentage profit to your deal. Uh, this was kind of just covered just a second ago about when to wean. Uh, you know, one of my clients uh, made a comment one day to me in the truck and said, everything's a compromise when we were talking about decision making. And, and I've really taken that to heart and thought about that. Everything we do in farming is a compromise. Uh, and I want to talk about delaying weaning into June. For those of you that are, that are considering weaning uh, right now, um, I, would, I really want to strongly uh, ask you to think about we waiting to wean these fall born calves. Uh, I think we can really maximize spring uh, flush grass usage. Uh, I think there's a lot of grass out there uh, that will go to waste because it will overgrow uh, that if we leave those calves on those fall cows, uh, they can kind of act a bit as bush hogs and keep that grass in the ideal growth stage during this lush spring flush. Uh, assuming we get through the next three days uh, of very cold temperatures uh, and, and grass does come on even better than it has, and that'll certainly be the cheapest way to put gain on these calves. Uh, I mean, that grass, uh, while nothing's free in life, uh, because I think a lot of it's extra growth that will, that will go to waste somewhat, uh, it, it's pretty valuable. Now, the cons are this cold snap we're going to have this weekend the slowing grass growth, you know, it's been cold all week for uh, for much of the state and grass is, grows kind of slowed down. And so uh, that makes a lot of us very nervous because now we don't have all this extra grass to get those cows through, uh, through the rest of the summer as our cool season grasses slow down and don't grow as well. Uh, but I tell you what, uh, I, think that's a, I think that's a pretty good gamble to take uh, given the relative value of of calves and, and cost of grain, uh, that's a risk that I'm willing to take personally. Uh, here's a little budget uh, that I put together uh, about weaning those calves today versus weaning those calves a month from now. Um, and I just looked at what the pasture cost would be and the hay cost uh, and grain cost for, for backgrounding those calves off the cow versus leaving them on the cow. Uh, and I think uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, pretty good potential add uh, to your net profit on these deals if we could get an extra month grazing out of that. I know many of y'all already do that, uh, but I think uh, when we're looking at lower cattle prices, calf prices, and then looking at uh, kind of stable grain prices uh, at moderate levels, I think it's really something we ought to, we ought, we ought, we ought to all be doing and, and everything and a good way to, to do that. Uh, out. The next question then becomes, how do you feed these animals? Um, I'm going to go something a little bit different here. Uh, we have some crazy times and that's an opportunity to think about doing things differently. Um, so when you think about it, when you wean these calves, we traditionally have taken these calves off the cows and uh, for many of us put them up into a confined area uh, with minimal grazing and fed them grain, uh, corn silage and or hay. Uh, and uh, that's, how, that's how we've done them. And, and I'm, I'm a fan of that system. I think that works well. Uh, but uh, the cows are at their lowest needs of requirements during this time frame. Pretty much any hay, just about no matter how bad it is out there, when you pull these calves off, they're in mid gestation uh, as far as their pregnancy goes they will get by with about any hay uh, and, and keep them fed. In reality, economically, from a pure economic standpoint and a nutritional standpoint, the calves are the ones that should stay out on the grass and be fed on the grass and the cows should be fed hay. Uh, you know, and we should be able to get pretty decent gains on these calves there. Now that's not the way we've done things and it's, something that's completely different, but it is an option. And depending on how you, I did the economic analysis and I took the price of traditional, doing it traditional way, weaning those calves, uh, putting them up and feeding them 
uh, and uh, and subtracted that if we did it backwards. And depending on how you value your hay and what you're having to pay for grain, uh, that tells you whether that's a good idea. If you value your hay up here to hundred dollars a ton, then doing it the traditional way is a better deal. Okay. If and I think hay is up in this range. If you're all the way down here, uh, if you value your hay at $60 a ton or you can purchase some hay uh, relatively cheaply from somebody that's had some hay left over or whatever, uh, then, then letting those calves utilize grass and putting those cows up and having them uh, eat hay right now will meet their nutrient requirements and give our animals that need that good high quality grass that we have right now uh, and we'll have hopefully through most of June for most of the part of the state of Virginia, the opportunity to get the most benefit. Now there's some real challenges to this different way of doing things. Uh, there are uh, the, the chances that you will damage the field that these cows are in uh, and damage the sod that they're in because they'll overgraze that and everything while you're trying to feed them hay and that sort of thing. So there's some real challenges uh, to doing things completely different. But if you look there, depending on how much you're paying for grain and how you uh, manage your hay, you could add a lot of net value to each individual calf you have just by doing something like this. Is there an alternative to doing it completely this way? Uh, sure, trying to find some grass to graze these calves on. Uh, if, the, if that's an opportunity, I know that's a challenge as well. But the more grass that we could graze these calves on, that's, that's, that's a good, pretty high quality area to graze these calves on, uh, will certainly give us a good return back because grass is always going, is almost always going to be a cheaper way to put weight on these calves. Now, when we get up into the hotter parts uh, of the summer, uh, into uh, late June, depending on how June is, sometimes middle June and into July, in the eastern and northern parts of the state, uh, then our cattle on grass don't tend to graze, don't tend to gain very well. And so, you know, that's when I would, would start, really start changing things up. But early on, at least, this opportunity to potentially think about doing things like that, that would be different. So you gotta feed both cows and calves. We're not used to feeding cows in the summertime. And so that would be completely different. And like I said, damage to sods in the fields containing cows. It's just something to think about from a different perspective than the way we've always done things just because that's the way we've always done them. Like I said, if you look at it from a pure economic and nutritional standpoint, that would be the way we should do things. Another question that I hear a lot and I hear people talking about a lot is what about slow feeding them? Let's just slow them down and feed them less and and just, and just have them not gain as much weight. So if you kind of look at backgrounding these calves, you know, at 10 pounds of grain plus hay, we would tend to think about about a pound, 175 average daily gain from a typical deal there. The steer break even price on that deal after backgrounding would be $1.26. If we slow them down to five pounds of grain and about, that's gonna equate to about a pound average daily gain, the steer break even price is going to be about a buck 32. Now, two pounds of gain, two pounds of grain, let's say I'm just barely feeding them a little bit just to say that they're weaned and, and feed bunk and broke, and I'm really going to do that. I'm going to, cattle prices are low and that sort of thing. Now, our steer break even price goes up to $1.37. Now, you're selling a smaller animal, so you ought to take about, to, in order to make this a true apples to apples comparison, you can, you can knock about two cents off of that uh, five pounds deal and about two more cents on top of that off of the off of the half pound deal uh, to make that a true adjusted for slide deal and so but it's still even at those deals unless uh, there's no reason to really slow feed these animals and have that be a really good deal it does extend your marketing options and so if you don't mind keeping those cattle and you really believe another month or two past July when you would tip, or August when you would typically market these calves, the, the market's finally gonna be come up then, then if you bet on the market coming, then, then you would win. 
but under the circumstances of our market staying the same and or improving in less than late fall time frame, then you're going to be better off, you're going to still be better off feeding these animals uh, at, at, to gain a decent rate of feed, slowing them down and feeding them less and that sort of thing and keeping them smaller is not going to be an advantage uh, for the most part. All right, uh, with that, I've kind of run through my scenarios and, and my things to give people some thoughts and, and, and to have them ponder uh, Dr. Griner. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Wilson and he's gonna, I think he's gonna talk about some, some of the impacts on the grain options that are out there for people to feed currently. Thank you, Dr. Curran. Uh, if you've got questions for Dr. Curran, please put those in the, uh, in the chat box while, while Bain's uploading his slides here. Um, there was a question about market reports that came in the chat box. And for those of you on the phone, I'll just briefly summarize that. Um, there are quite a few USDA reports, marketing market reports, which are not being reported. Um, and that's due to COVID-19. Um, best suggestion is go to the, the VDAX website, uh, their livestock marketing website. Uh, the weekly sales are on there. All the cattle prices are on there like they typically are. Uh, for the sheep prices, you'll probably have to look at the Winchester weekly market and then the, uh, the Madison monthly market. Uh, those are being reported. So uh, you may find quite a few national or even uh, uh, regional, as Matt mentioned, the New Holland uh, sheep and goat and even their cattle markets are not being reported by USDA, uh, but go to the VDAX website and look for those. With that, turn it over to Dr. Uh, Dr. Wilson and share a few things about where we stand on feed and prices and, and so forth so as it impacts our uh, um, livestock industry. Bain? All right, can y'all hear me? I uh, hope you can. Yes, sir. All right. So um, I'm just going to provide a little bit of an update about kind of where maybe the, the feed markets are. And I'll say I got kind of the, the digging into this and it's a little bit like grasping at straws. Uh, kind of your, your data is really scattered out there. It's harder to get maybe as a complete a view of that. And that's really because we've got kind of futures level prices and then you go down to all these different local level markets. So I'll try to kind of provide some thoughts on that and then probably a lot of that is you're going to be able to best uh, kind of figure out what your local um, options are. And then we'll talk about kind of maybe some ways to just evaluate those in case you're seeing prices vary a lot from what you're used to typically. So kind of this, the first slide I've got here is just uh, kind of pick up where I left off uh, two weeks ago. And this is really still the same is that uh, DD, uh, dry distillers grains is, kind of, you know, the last 10 years been one of our main kind of feed and energy uh, co-products that's kind of worked its way into about, about every kind of ration type. Oh, we had that um, ag update with Andrew Griffith from Tennessee a couple weeks ago, at least within uh, kind of a Virginia Cooperative Extension, and he kind of made the comment that everybody's forgotten how to feed corn. And well, you know, that might be for good reason, but this current COVID situation is completely, uh, uh, decrease the the demand for that ethanol to be produced and thus dry distillers grains are really not available and if they are they're at a much much higher uh, price that we need to consider maybe our use of those at this time. Um, I've also kind of got on this slide uh, disruptions in, in other commodities uh, like corn gluten feed, soybean meal, soy holes, or maybe just our corn and and other kind of small grain markets and um, the Virginia Tech, uh, the Ag Econ Group shared a really good report, and I think they're going to kind of work to get that shared more widely with uh, at the producer level. Um, I was reading that this morning, and and, and yes, uh, these these grain futures have lost significant value since January first, but the cash market in Virginia looks like it's it's pretty strong, kind of going with the very positive basis seen there. So there's a little bit maybe of a discrepancy between maybe the, the futures markets and maybe some of your local cash markets. Just to drive home the point about uh, dry distillers grains a little bit more, I found a pretty good article kind of written about three weeks ago, two to three weeks ago in uh, Beef Magazine. And um, I think this uh, figure here is pretty striking in that you can kind of see this is the reason why dry distillers grains aren't going to be 
available. And I'll keep, I'll come talking about those early on because that seems to be the, the main feedstuffs that's been affected the most uh, by the COVID situation. You can see that ethanol production has really uh, decreased pretty big time here. It's taken a nosedive, but at the same time, the weekly ethanol inventory is a really all time high. So of course they're, they're not going to be producing. They've uh, shuttered those plants and the, this Beef Mart magazine article stated that about 71 ethanol plants have been idled throughout the country. And then kind of looking at, I was trying to kind of get a, a grasp of, of maybe what we've seen more locally or at least regionally as far as feed prices go. And um, kind of at the bottom of the slide, I've got a couple different just sources of maybe some of our Corn Co products, what's kind of happened to them. I could have listed a lot, quite a few other feeds here, but this is kind of what uh, I thought maybe hit, whether we're talking about uh, commodity blends or going to feed cattle, or maybe if we're getting bulk commodities in from our different uh, local feed mills there. So in this figure here, or this table, kind of the top two prices, that's some prices that I guess that we've actually paid for some, uh, some research studies we've done here at Virginia Tech. Uh, these are some uh, kind of more local prices. Um, from Southside, Virginia, and that was kind of June 2019 versus May of 2020. So actually, we are a couple weeks ago when we ordered some more feed, we paid less than we did last year. But uh, kind of the other uh, information I have here is I take I took from uh, Mid Atlantic uh, kind of regional prices from uh, Feed Sense kind of update that Feed Components puts out, and you can see that for corn gluten feed kind of year over year, May 2019, 2020, that they've gone up about $60 per ton, kind of according to that kind of regional average. And then the big thing with distillers is a year ago, they were $160 a ton. Um, kind of about February, kind of late March, uh, they were sitting about $205. And that was kind of as this these plants started to, to shut down, that price was increasing. And then there was kind of communication from a lot of feed mills that, hey, you probably need to go ahead and order feed now. And maybe we, we don't know what our availability of that's going to be. So a lot of people have had to adjust their rations to kind of change around their, their to decrease, to decrease their inclusions of distiller's grains. And kind of that same source now, if you can get any, that feed is now $100 more than it was a year ago. So if you're um, kind of sitting here more at your local level, uh, Dr. Uh, Curran talked about background in cattle, and that's probably a lot of our uh, feed use at this point, is uh, be cognizant of kind of that local availability might have changed and what that price point is, and kind of plan to, to, be, to buy early. If, you know, if you're feed needing, if you're weaning next week, go ahead and get on the phone now so you can kind of evaluate what those other options might be. And really probably the best way to do that on an apples to apples basis is to um, really kind of price those feeds on a per unit of nutrient. Um, and what that would kind of entail, uh, I don't want to get too deep in the math. I've got on the next couple slides worked out, but uh, calculate the price of that feed on a per pound of dry matter basis. Um, so take your ass fed price that you would pay at the, at the feed store or the feed mill, um, take that, um, Get that down to a, a price that on a, a pound of ass fed uh, basis and then if you've got kind of your your feed tag or your nutrient analysis you'll have that dry matter value and you can figure out what that is on a dry matter uh, pounds of dry matter basis and then you're going to divide that by basically the percentage of that nutrient of interest whether it be tdn crude protein and and um, then you can get per pound the pounds uh, per nutrient so um, just kind of the example for that is I've got corn and corn gluten feed kind of compared here. The table at the bottom's kind of got the, the kind of the underlying assumptions there of the, the bushel price for corn or the, the dollars per ton for corn gluten feed. I used the, the price that I uh, paid most recently for gluten. And for, for corn, you kind of got to factor in how many, pound, how many uh, pounds per bushel you've got. Um, so that's 56 for corn, and you get that kind of worked out to uh, basically $0.07 cent per pound of ass-fed, factor in your dry matter, and that price is going to go up to about a little over $0.08. Cent. Um, and then your TDN, 
your book value for TDN on corn, I pulled that was 88%. So that you're looking at basically about nine cent per pound of TDN. If you're to do the same thing with corn gluten feed, you know, you're dealing with a, a pounds per ton basis, you're gonna get the 13 cent per pound. And then that gets to 14 cent per pound on a dry matter basis. Um, our research data we've got says that that TDN, a uh, conservative value for TDN based on actual cattle performance when we feed this stuff is 92% TDN. So we get that to about 15 and a half cent per pound of TDN. So in this, in this basis, you can say, well, per pound of energy, uh, corn's my better buy at these different price points. Um, one thing to keep in mind is corn gluten is you've got really double the crude protein. So that does kind of have maybe affect your, your decision a little bit as well. Won't go through the math on this slide too much here, but basically this kind of works out the same thing with a, kind of a commodity blend. Um, this would be a, this information would be off a commodity blend we fed on a study last fall. And then just maybe comparing that back to straight corn gluten feed and you could see that on a pound, a cost per unit of crude protein, that commodity blend is actually a little, little bit cheaper there, by about a cent per pound of crude protein, or 10 cent. If you don't wanna do all that math yourself, um, and I don't blame you, uh, probably the best resource that I've found uh, for this, you can input your own uh, local kind of feed cost. So you call up your feed mill, get their cost, is this, um, compared to feed value calculator from the University of Arkansas. Um, it's Excel based, you can download it. I've got the link kind of there at the bottom, but you can just Google that. And um, it's gonna be preloaded with some different uh, values, but all of these values kind of right here on the ASFED part of this, you can uh, put your own values in there. Um, it's got some, some book values and that's fine if you don't wanna mess with those, but you can put your own uh, local prices in here. And it's going to compare it to uh, corn and as on an energy basis and soybean meal on a protein basis. Those are kind of our gold standard energy and protein feeds. And then you kind of get out here and then it, it kind of calculates and populates all of all of this out. And essentially you're going to get these different ratios of what um, of what that actual value is. And you're going to want um, actually a better ratio there. That'd be a better buy. So that's something you get, you all can do at home there if you don't want to do the long hand math. I'm going to put a little bit of a, a plug in here for just uh, thinking about getting your, your commodity blends tested. I know a lot of you, that's kind of what you're looking at doing uh, with uh, background in cattle. And they're, those um, products, they're going to try to keep that cost as low as possible without distillers being, with distillers not being available or a much higher level, they've likely changed the, the blends and proportions of those different blends and ingredients. So anytime that's gonna change, that's gonna change the nutritive uh, value and nutritive profile of those feeds. So I think that's a good blend, a good day. If you can't get an analysis from that feed mill, you might wanna look at getting your own before you spend 60, 90 days feeding that to your whole calf crop there. Um, that $30 or $20 or whatever it's going to be, it'd be worth it to just know exactly what you're feeding. And then just kind of this next slide, um, our, our main uh, options for getting feed uh, tested is kind of Cumberland Valley or Dairy One. And um, these are kind of the, 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 the packages that they have that, that seem to probably fit our needs the best when it comes to what we need to formulate a beef ration. You can pay for a lot more add-ons, a lot more bells and whistles. A lot of those are more dairy related, but these are kind of the base, what should cover your basis in terms of kind of a, your background in beef ration. There's been some discussion about holding market livestock. And if you've searched the internet at all, you're starting to see a lot of uh, stories pop up about this. And, and it really is a pretty complex, uh, probably just, decision tree kind of process and, and, and that's going to vary based on your search current situation. If you are a situation where you're trying to hold market livestock, you know, we're not a, a cattle feeding state by any means, but I know that, that certain people do feed quite a bit. And we've had some, some, some disruptions in terms of uh, slaughter facilities. I know in Pennsylvania is kind of our big commercial ones uh, close to us. So I would say beware of maximums for fat thickness for your market livestock. And However, you can't just simply 
expect to feed these cattle for zero gain and expect that carcass quality to, to hold up. I mean, that would be extremely hard to do and be really ex extreme uh, kind of nutritional management. You can decrease the energy in the diet to reduce your, your daily feed costs, but you need to be cognizant that you don't just uh, completely tank on not meeting your protein requirements. You know, if you've got a, a pretty good TMR, you're feeding those cattle, they're gaining over three pounds a day and you just throw um, a high level of just really low quality forage, you need to also check that you're still meeting their, their protein requirements. So possible target average daily gains, if you've got heavyweight cattle that are really are at or past uh, kind of the ideal market weight, you know, any more that's a little over, that's for over 1400 pounds. You don't want to just completely feed them for zero pounds per day because they'll kind of really lose ground on you. But you might want to just kind of adjust them, your ration to go to two pounds per day. And if you're looking at lighter weight cattle that are 60, 90 days out, you might want to just slow them down to maybe like three pounds per day. If you're going to keep them going um, three pounds a day, you can reach uh, ideal carcass uh, quality at that point that you're just going to take a little time to get there and you can decrease your cost along the way. So you don't create an immediate problem with you for you in the next month to two months. Probably, uh, I would say probably the better option uh, for how you can and slow that rate of gain down would be adding forage to decrease your energy content. And that's going to keep those cattle consuming feed uh, ad lib. And that's kind of what they've been uh, pro programmed to do is consume ad lib feed. You can limit feed the same diet and just uh, not feed that to ad lib, a little bit of intake, but you need enough bunk space to do that. So the competitive nature of, of those cattle, certain cattle in that uh, pen weren't, didn't just tank up and still eat ad lib and other cattle not get enough feed. So you need to not have enough bunk space to spread that feed out. And that's maybe a little bit trickier from a management standpoint, depending on your um, facilities. A lot of the, these concepts are broken down extremely well in a uh, YouTube video that University of Illinois Extension put out. Um, I'm not advocating their uh, resource, maybe other, other universities. It's just that I kind of have some colleagues there and know they, they've done a pretty nice job, have about a 20 minute kind of video interview that they did. And I've got the link there and there's kind of the title of that video. And they kind of go through a couple of decision trees to maybe break down these concepts a little bit more if that's something you're, you're tackling. And then lastly, um, if you are in a situation, whether it be for your background in cattle, feedlot cattle, whatever you have going on, if you're needing to make a ration change, definitely work with whoever you're already working with, whether that be your, your local uh, kind of a, a feed sales rep, a nutritionist, whether it be your extension agent. Um, but here's maybe some resources for, for just adjusting those rations if you are need to make a change and maybe need to figure what you are doing now versus what you need to do a little bit tighter that resource. So with that, I'll kind of wrap it up and turn it back over to Dr. Greiner. Thank you, Bain. Appreciate that. Um, if you've got uh, questions, um, feel free to unmute your mic if you'd like to and uh, share those uh, or you can share those in the chat box as well if you'd like. Um, I'm going to put up a slide here. Any questions for any of our speakers? As a quick reminder, our next uh, webinar is going to be uh, two weeks from now, May 22nd, and we've recorded today's session. So we will um, get that posted as well.